So today we're going to be talking about patterns of inheritance. It's going to seem very similar to the concept of dominant and recessive genes that we had quite a while ago. Let's get started. So we're going to take a look at another look, sorry, at dominant and recessive traits today. As we've seen before, dominant traits totally overwrite recessive traits. In other words, if you have one dominant characteristic, it totally overwrites any of the recessive characteristics you hold on to. Or does it? We're going to explain today also some traits that get blended in offspring. So in other words, traits that aren't fully dominant. Uh, for example, imagine if you bred a dark brown horse with a white horse, you'd actually find that you'd end up getting a light brown horse, despite the fact that dark brown is a dominant uh, hair color, right? Why is that? Well, we'll talk about why that happens. The last thing we're going to talk about today is we're going to discuss some other factors that can change what traits appear in the offspring. It's really the focus today, what traits are showing up in offspring, and how can we predict that? So it was nice learning about dominant and recessive earlier on. There's something else that goes a little further with this, though. So before we get into that though, lo, lo, before we get into that though, let's recall that a genotype is the description of the genetic makeup of an organism. It tells exactly what alleles the organism holds. Remember, the alleles are the actual components of a gene. So for example, capital B, capital B, that's a genotype. In other words, it tells you what alleles are present within that, uh, that gene. Now they're capital letters in this case because each of those alleles, both capital B and capital B, those are both dominant for whatever that's representing, right? Now, the phenotype is what you actually see. And remember, I always remembered it by saying phenotype starts with pH, kind of like the word photo, right? And a photo is something you see. So phenotype is what you actually see. So for example, a flower being purple, that's a phenotype. If you're making an observation. You're looking at the flower and you're saying, that's a purple flower, therefore it's a phenotype. Now, we also use the term homozygous to describe organisms that had two of the same allele. And it could be either both dominant or both recessive. In this little chart here, capital B, capital B, that's homozygous because they're the same, and it's dominant. Lowercase, lowercase b, that's homozygous, but it's recessive because they're both lowercase letters. So they're both recessive, right? Now, the term heterozygous is one we introduced to refer to organisms that had different alleles. A capital B and a lowercase b, for example, that's heterozygous because they're different, okay? Moving on. So there was another thing we talked about with that. Homozygous and heterozygous are the scientific terms that we prefer to use. However, the terms purebred and hybrid are often used among animal and plant breeders. Now, in terms of biology, purebred is generally the same thing as homozygous. So when people are referring to something that's purebred, it probably means it has a homozygous uh, genotype, right? Now, a hybrid is generally the same thing as heterozygous because it's the offspring of two parents with different characteristics. So in this photo, for instance, you have a mother cat who's white and a father cat that's black, yet all of their offspring uh, are black. This is because both of these parents, uh, it doesn't say so in this picture, but you can deduce this using a Punnett square if you have to, but both of these parents are therefore uh, purebred. Or in other words, both of them have the same homozygous uh, alleles. This one, being a black cat, of course, that's the dominant color, would be a capital B, capital B. And this one would be a lowercase b, lowercase b. Now, no matter which allele the father passes down, the father's still going to be passing a capital B. Therefore, all of these kittens definitely have a capital B allele. Meanwhile, the mother, who only has a lowercase b and a lowercase b, she has no choice but to pass on one of those lowercase b's. So all of these kittens are all going to be heterozygous. So in other words, in terms of how breeders would put it, they're all going to be hybrids, okay? Now, I don't like using those terms purebred and hybrid because it comes uh, apart when we look at a little bit more of complex examples, not to mention it's just not as sciencey as usual, uh, but we'll get into that in just a second here as well. Uh, so despite all the kittens being technically hybrids, they still all appear black. And that would be because they would all carry both a black allele and a white allele, just like I showed you. Their genotype, genotype would be capital B, lowercase b, Black fur is the dominant trait. Now, in terms of DNA, the instructions in the DNA, quote unquote, instructions in the DNA for the cat to develop black fur overwrites the instructions for the cat to develop white fur. So going back here a second, even though they all have a white hair uh, allele, the dominant one totally overwrites, completely nullifies it. It's like the white uh, allele wasn't even there in the first place. Now, the offspring are not a mix of white and black because of this. The black one totally overwrites it. So it's not like they're gray or whatever, right? They're just black. This is called complete dominance. And it's the only type of dominant trait we've been looking at up to this point. 
where you have a trait that is totally dominant. If it shows up, it totally overwrites everything else. So complete dominance, that's the term you would need to know for that. Now, if we look at another example though, and this is where it kind of falls apart with the terms purebred and hybrid, uh, when you crossbreed hybrids, so two hybrid cats, so they're capital B, lowercase b, if you crossbred two hybrid cats, you're actually gonna produce uh, some different outcomes. Since both parents carry both a dominant and a recessive allele, there is a chance for both parents to pass their recessive allele and thus produce a recessive offspring. Completing a Punnett square for this is really gonna illustrate it. Remember, a Punnett square basically just looks like a window, four different boxes in it, and we put each of the parents on the sides of it, so one on the top and one on the other side. So we'll put the mother on the top, so capital B, lowercase b, and we'll put the father on the side over here, so capital B, lowercase b. Not that it matters, they have the exact same genotype, you can go either way. Uh, anyway, so in this box, they're gonna get a capital B from their mother and a capital B from their father. So this kitten is gonna be capital B, capital B. This next one's gonna get a lowercase b and a capital B, so capital B, lowercase b. I always put the capitals first, it's just good measure. This next one down here, capital B, lowercase b, and the last one, lowercase b, lowercase b. Notice when I do that, three out of the four offspring, three out of the four are going to be black, just like this picture shows and one of the four is going to be white because it carries two recessive alleles. Again, that is showing uh, complete dominance. So even though these ones only have um, a capital B and a lowercase b, they still show up as being black kittens in terms of their uh, phenotype. This is why that hybrid and purebred definition kind of falls apart. By all you know, definitions, two hybrid cats should produce hybrid offspring. Right, so all hybrid cats should produce hybrid offspring. But notice that this cat, we'll say this is the capital B, capital B one, uh, and this cat, they're technically, in terms of their genotype, they're technically purebred. So we've had like half of the offspring from hybrid cats actually produce something that genetically speaking is purebred. So that really shows why I don't like those terms. Homozygous and heterozygous kind of make those points a little bit better but there's still important terms to know. So it's important to understand that purebred and hybrid can be still used to, uh, to show this. So now with complete dominance, where the, the dominant trait totally takes over, we need to look at something else called incomplete dominance. So not all traits are gonna follow that same pattern of dominant and recessive. It is possible for some traits to blend. So in other words, for you to have a mix of the two traits, some of the dominant and some of the recessive. This is called incomplete dominance because the dominant trait is not a complete takeover, it's just a partial takeover, okay? Uh, here's a couple examples. The flowers of the snapdragon plant can show incomplete dominance. So if you had a red plant that was crossed with a white plant, it would produce pink plants because the red and the white would mix to make pink. That is actually a case of incomplete dominance because it's not like all of these became red or all of them became white. Uh, they did actually produce pink offspring. And this picture, of course, shows them. There's a real photos, of course, of red, white, and uh, a pink snapdragon. Uh, the same thing occurs with horses uh, and a lot of other animals, too. We're not just using horses as the, the end-all, be-all example. But if you had a dark brown horse and you cross it with a white horse, you're going to get a light brown horse, generally speaking. It's a lot more complicated than this. There's a lot more to it than just these little simple traits. And, and again, we'll get into that in a moment, too. Uh, but again, it is a good rule of thumb, and that does come down to this idea of incomplete dominance, where it's not just one trait taking totally over, it's more like the traits are blending together. Uh, now, offspring, unlike either parent, this is where we kind of get into where it gets a lot more complicated. It's important to understand that many traits aren't just determined by a single gene location in the organism's DNA. Remember, in your full strand of DNA, only one small segment forms an actual gene. So the reality is a lot more complex than what we've looked at, but our simplification that we've looked at so far is mostly accurate. But it is important to know that just because your parents have blue eyes, uh, so if you did a Punnett square, you'd think, oh, it's a 100%, 100 chance of having blue eyes uh, as the offspring. Uh, it is actually possible for two blue-eyed parents to have a child with brown eyes. And that is because the gene for eye color, for instance, is not located just on one part of your DNA strand. It could be found in several parts of your DNA, not just one, okay? Uh, so another thing that can happen is actually, uh, it is actually possible for some people to have different color eyes. One eye is one color, or one color and the other eye is the other color, right? Uh, a very famous example of someone having this was uh, David Bowie. David Bowie, of course, was a musician, a uh, very famous musician. He passed away just a couple of years ago now, uh, and he actually did have one blue eye and one brown eye. 
And again, that would have a lot to do with the fact that the gene for your eye color is located on several different parts of your DNA strand and not just one. So somehow it ended up that he had one blue eye and one brown eye. Uh, the last thing we'll talk about here is environmental factors. Uh, so the environment can play a role in how these traits are expressed as well. Now it's important to note that the environment, generally speaking, and again, there are some extreme circumstances where this is wrong, but generally speaking, the environment doesn't actually change your DNA outright. Now, there are some exceptions, radiation is a big one, um, but generally speaking, your DNA doesn't change because of the environment. Here's a very infamous example. In the 1950s, there was a drug used for treating something called morning sickness for pregnant women, uh, and they called the drug thalidomide, okay? Now, thalidomide was later discovered to cause abnormal limb development. In other words, children of mothers that would take thalidomide while they were pregnant would often be born with malformed limbs, right? Now, what's interesting about this is it just was a way of affecting how their limbs developed. It didn't actually affect their DNA. A lot of the children of thalidomide, the kids that grew up uh, with the, the shortened limbs, they grew up and many of them ended up having offspring of their own. And it was noted that their offspring was totally normal. Also, analyzing their DNA showed that there wasn't any DNA abnorm abnormalities. It was just a developmental issue. So in other words, uh, thalidomide behaved a lot like if someone was malnourished as a child. If they didn't get enough food growing up, maybe they wouldn't grow as tall as they would have if they had a full, complete, balanced diet, right? That's kind of the same idea here. So thalidomide didn't change their DNA. It only changed the way that their traits were expressed. Anyway, that was a long ramble on that. But anyway, for practice today, I want you guys to work on page 54, questions two to six. Let me just remind you, uh, if you don't have a textbook, because I know there's at least one of us who don't, uh, I do post these questions on the week plan. You just have to scroll down to the bottom, like where you find what you have to do for every day. Just scroll down to the bottom, and I actually have just the questions posted in there, so they are available for you to access. It's the only part that I, I give to you, but it's there uh, in case you need them. Uh, if you need any help with this, please send me an email, send me a remind, post a comment on Google Classroom, you know, the whole usual. Uh, and the other thing is, and I know on a broken record, I've said this a million times before, check your emails like every single day. Like literally every day, just check your email. And if you see an email from me, please respond to it. I just need to make sure you're understanding. Uh, if you're not understanding, and if I'm seeing that you're not understanding, I'll be uh, chasing some of you down. I'll be giving you phone calls and stuff. Anyway, enough of a ramble for me. Best of luck with these questions. Uh, contact me if you need any help.